Certainly x-rays are important. And it's amazing how x-rays kind of fell by the wayside until FAI came along, because everybody's really looking at MRIs and stuff. But with FAI, we realize the importance of understanding the morphology. You want a properly centered AP pelvis view. I think everybody agrees on that. But what do you do if the, you get an AP pelvis and it's not properly centered? Do you go back and hold the, the x-ray tech's hand and try to get it just right? To me, as long as it's reasonably centered, I'll go ahead and accept it. And then as I'm assessing various indices, I'll just try to account for the fact that if there's some rotational malalignment. You know, do you need to get a supine or standing? Well, we'll routinely get a supine that Gons makes the argument that's a position we operate on people. The standing x-rays are a little more challenging to get correct orientation. I think where the standing x-rays help you the most are in people who have dysplasia or potential instability problems, because it does help you to appreciate the orientation of the pelvis in space when they're standing, because the, the, the version of the acetabulum changes substantially. Now, the lateral view is usually obtained to assess the cam morphology, and the epicenter of the cam lesion is variable, so there's no single lateral x-ray that's best for everybody. We'll just get a frog lateral. And the reason I get a frog lateral is it's been shown to be a, a good image. Remember, this isn't a lateral of the hip joint. It's just a lateral of the proximal femur. And the main thing, it's easy to get a reproducible x-ray. So you're able to interpret it the same way every time. On average, the 45 degree done view is probably going to catch the epicenter of the cam lesion more often, but it's a little trickier to get a good done view. So again, if it's not quite right, do you send them back and keep shooting more images? And, and I'll come back to that in a moment. You know, the cross table lateral is a true lateral, but we rarely ever get a cross table lateral. Uh, it doesn't give you that much more information. And it takes a lot of radiation exposure for penetration to get a cross table lateral. Now the false profile is really outside of the pelvis and frog lateral is, is in occasionally weight bearing view is my go-to view. Uh, it can help you to look at anterior coverage, dysplasia, and over coverage. You can look at the subspine morphology, but probably more importantly in my hands, when you see somebody where you're worried about degenerative disease, joint space narrowing, this is just a typical example of a couple of 50-something year old gals, both with right hip pain, and their AP pelvis doesn't look that bad. But on the frog lateral, you can appreciate the anterior joint space narrowing in the top view and the posterior joint space narrowing in, in the bottom example, showing you this is somebody that you don't need to bother to try to scope their hip just to, to have a disappointed patient. This is somebody who's better served by an arthroplasty. Now, I tend to be a minimalist on the x-rays because again, all the x-rays give you these two-dimensional images trying to interpret the complex three-dimensional three anatomy of the hip. It's kind of like sort of trying to interpret tea leaves with the x-rays and that's where the 3D CT scan eliminates the guesswork. And I tend to save my radiation exposure on x-rays, keep that to minimum for the 3D CT scans. We have low dose protocols that report to be the equivalent of five hip x-rays. I don't think anybody knows for sure. So I certainly don't blow it off, say no big deal, but we don't get CT scans as part of a routine workup. But if we've got somebody, we've made the decision we're gonna operate on them and we're thinking that bony, correction or bony architecture may be a factor, then we'll get the 3D CT scan. Now, as far as MRIs, uh, they may incompletely define what's going on in the hip, but th they're important to assess for disorders that arthroscopy may not detect or may contraindicate arthroscopy, such as stress fractures, AVN tumors, transient regional osteoporosis, just to mention a few. Now, as far as MRI standards, I think for the hip, it's got to be at least a 1.5 Tesla magnet with dedicated surface coils. 3T magnets may be a little beneficial for bigger patients, but a 1.5 is usually adequate. You want some large field of view images and then some dedicated small field of view images as well. Now, as far as gadolinium arthrography, it may give you a little better sensitivity, especially for suboptimal scanners. Uh, there's some potential for false positive interpretations. We always inject anesthetic along with the contrast. And as we noted before, because uh, in injecting anesthetic is, is more important as far as assessing the clinical relevance of what's going on. And that's where gadolinium MRIs do have some caveats, because once you inject contrast, 
you lose the ability to see whether there's any effusion because sometimes a little bit of an asymmetric effusion may be the only thing you see. The contrast can obscure the presence of underlying subchondral and soft tissue edema. And there's ample experience that the contrast can negate the effect of the anesthetic. Uh, and, and I know, as, I think there's a comment in here that I think some people worry about toxicity of the, of the gadolinium. Now this is just an example. The left-hand view is a post-contrast image. It shows a label tear, but is that a label cleft or a tear? Well, on the pre-contrast images on the right, you can see the amount of effusion, which tells you this patient was clearly in trouble that you, wouldn't, you can't tell that from the post-contrast images. These are just a couple of examples of pre-contrast images showing subchondral changes on the coronal and sagittal images. And on the post-contrast images, you can kind of see where the lesion is, but it's nowhere near as evident. As far as intraarticular findings, MRIs are best at showing label tears and less reliable at showing articular damage, lesions to the ligamentum teres. A paralabral cyst is pretty much pathognomonic. If you see a paralabral cyst, there should be a label tear somewhere. Now, anterior label tears are most common because most of these are associated with FAI. The tearing begins anterior and then works laterally from there. Uh, and the anterior label tears are best seen on the sagittal and oblique axial images. And if you have a radiology department where they're trying to skimp on imaging to speed business through, the ones they tend to skip are the sagittal and oblique axial. So you want to make sure they get those uh, views for you. Now, lateral label tears can sometimes just be an extension of an anterior label tear, and sometimes it can be a normal cleft like this. And if you're trying to tell, is it a cleft or a tear, most times I'll look at the anterior labrum, because if the anterior labrum is normal, then laterally that's probably a cleft, because the tearing usually begins anterior and works laterally. Now, the exception to that is with dysplasia, where the tearing will begin laterally, and there's usually some element of hypertrophy. Posterior labral tears really just are an extension of what's going on anteriorly. Often there's a generous posterior cleft. So most times if you see an MRI report that says there's a posterior labral tear, just assume that's probably a cleft. Now one thing to be aware of is posterior rim fractures are oftentimes interpreted as a posterior labral tear on MRI because this is hard cortical bone. You don't get bony edema that you would expect to see a lot of edema with the posterior rim fracture but oftentimes that's simply not present. MRIs are less predictable assessing the severity of articular damage, subchondral edema, and cystic changes are oftentimes important indirect signs that the articular surface is getting into trouble. For me, I just assume the articular damage is gonna be worse than what the MRIs show. And I tell the patients that that's the wild card. That's a part we just won't know for sure until the time of arthroscopy. So you're not, getting lulled to, oh, it's just a label tear and get in there and find out there's something more going on that may negatively influence the outcome. The Jemmerich MRI and a variety of other techniques are coming to the forefront of being able more sensitive at assessing chondral damage. I think this will become important in the future as we get normative data so we can start to predict, you know, when has somebody's hip sort of exceeded the point that corrective surgery is no longer going to potentially be beneficial for it. Now you'll see reports of high MRI predictability, sensitivity, and specificity, but most of us aren't gonna see that in our practices. And, and, and I think MRIs are as much helpful for what they rule out as they are what they rule in. Certainly need to be cautious about false positives, but otherwise uh, just keep in mind they tend to incompletely detect the extent of the intraarticular pathology. 